morning we have uh, chapter 18 of a uh, comprehensive gyne and then the, the title of the chapter is benign gynecologic lesions okay so when you talk of gynecologic lesions it's either benign or malignant okay so when you are faced with a patient with an abdominal mass or a hypogastric mass, sometimes you wonder, is it a benign mass or a malignant one? Okay? So for today, we're going to talk only of the, what are the possible conditions that are considered benign. Okay? So these are your, uh, these are the things that you will consider. So the lecture for today when we talk of benign gynecologic lesions. Oh no, how can I? Okay, when we talk of benign lesions of the reproductive tract, it means the lesions of the vulva, the vagina, the cervix, the oviducts, no? So everything here, no? From the vulva outside, no? to the vagina, to the cervix, and then the uterus, and then the oviducts, which refers to the fallopian tube, and finally the ovaries. Okay, so there's a lot of new lesions that you'll be hearing today. Get that? Okay. Good. So when we say benign, lesions, it has to have benign characteristics. Like it should be slow growing, it is well circumscribed, it's not associated with hemorrhage. So it the, the surface of the lesion will be very smooth. There are no uh, hemorrhages, there's it's not necrotic, and there are no widespread dissemination, no metastases. And that the patient will not have signs and symptoms like weight loss and anorexia, okay, or loss of appetite. And uh, however, in order to tell us that a lesion is really benign, then uh, a tissue diagnosis has to be um, done. No? Uh, biopsy of the tissue has to be done. Okay, so for today, we're going to describe and identify the common benign lesions and conditions that affect the female genital tract. And we discuss these lesions as to the description, the occurrence, the pathogenesis, and the management. So what are we going to do with these lesions? Okay, if you read your book, have you tried opening the chapters? on uh, benign lesions, chapter 18. Did you try opening? No? Wait, ha. Wait, wait. Hello, Anne. Yeah? Oh, nag-lecture na ako dito. Ito ba ganun mo? Ha? Asa na ka daw? lecture pa ako. 9 to 10 ang lecture, ha? Sa clinic. Eh, diri sa balay. Sige lang, mamaya. Sabihan mo na. I-move lang clinic hours. Ano Ten o'clock. Okay, okay. Ten? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Sorry. So if you talk of lesions, there's a lot in your book and it's a long chapter. And these are all the lesions that you'll be able to see. But today, we will not tackle all of this. It will take a long time. So when you will be encountered with some with patients with benign lesions, you can always open up your book and read on it. So we're going to tackle on the common ones. So let's start with the vulva. Okay? The vulva, look at that. This is the structure. So when you say vulva, so these are the structures that you can see in the vulva. And if you have lesions um, that pertain to these structures, then they are vul called vulvar lesions. 
And if it's benign, then it's a benign lesion of the vulva. Okay? Okay, so start with the urethral caruncle. This is a very common lesion. It's a small fleshy mass that occurs at the posterior portion of the urethral matus. So this is the urethral matus. That's the posterior portion. This is an example of a urethral caruncle. It's sometimes it's, it looks like this. It's soft, smooth, friable, and it's bright red in color. This is the more common one, the one in the lower picture. Can you see my laser pointer? Let's change the color. Yes, sir. Okay. There. Okay. So it's small. Sometimes it's sessile. Sometimes it's pedunculated. No? And it's very small, just about 1 to 2 cm in diameter. And you see this in postmenopausal women. So you and you'll be exposed in the in your fourth year in the outpatient department, whether in the health center or at SPMC. So there's a lot of patients who have postmenopause who have this type of lesion. The pathogenesis of a caruncle, it is caused by a distal urethral prolapse due to estrogen deficiency. So look at this. That's the caruncle. And if usually these patients will come in because of vaginal spotting, things like that, but not hemorrhage, no? And the chronic irritation, it might be due to chronic irritation. And the chronic irritation contributes to the growth, hemorrhage, and necrosis of the lesion. Okay? So it also arises from an ectropion of the posterior urethral wall. It is a retraction and atrophy of the postmenopausal vagina. So that's why it's cost, uh, common in postmenopause. Now, the symptoms, they're usually variable, and most of them asymptomatic, even if that is present in the postmenopause. Uh, women do not come in for symptoms related to that. No? Seldom, seldom do we, did they complain of dysuria, frequency, or urgency. But there can be point tenderness after contact with the undergarment. If it is a big um if it is a big caruncle, no? or during intercourse. And if there's an ulcerative lesion, it causes vaginal spotting. Another lesion is prolapse of the urethral mucosa, as opposed to the urethral caruncle. This one, it usually occurs in premenarchial female. No? It's like part of the anatomy that is not the usual anatomy. It is presents asymptomatically. It's usually annular rosette. It's very friable. It's grossly edematous. It's pinkish to reddish in color. Maybe ulcerated if it touches the undergarment. So this is also another picture of a prolapse urethral mucosa. Okay, it's the whole mucosa that prolapses, whereas in the uh, urethral caruncle, the caruncle arises from the distal urethra. Okay, only. So, what is the treatment for these two? Could be uh, oral or topical estrogen avoidance of irritation. But if there is no regression, regression to this initial treatment then the patient might be referred for cryosurgery, laser therapy, fulguration, or operative excision. So vulvar cysts. Next, lesion. Vulvar cysts. Okay. Uh, these are also common occurrence in the vulva. Okay, the most common would be a Bartholin's gland cyst. It is the most common larger vulvar cysts. This one, it's usually 
uh, ducts of the mucous glands of the vestibule that are occluded, okay? And sometimes it's non-inflamed. When it's non-inflamed, it usually contains sterile, clear mucinous fluid, and it's usually asymptomatic. But when it enlarges, it can produce symptoms. See, it as a con it it arises from a continuation of the uh, vulva of the uh, labia minora. So this is the labia. Okay. So when it enlarges and the fluid has been there for quite some time, so the space is already, that's when sometimes you have an abscess formation already because of the stasis of the fluid. And when it becomes an abscess, it becomes symptomatic. And the patient will complain of severe vulvar pain. Then it's a block. Okay. So that's what happens. When the patient will have the cyst, she will not come to the doctor already because of the cyst. But when there's an abscess, that will be the reason why they can will consult the doctor. Okay. As you see, you have the bar the location of the Barthelin's gland is on the um what's this fourth or five o'clock position. Seven or eight o'clock position. So these are the Bartholin's glands, and upper are the skin glands, and these are uh, cysts can occur also on the skin glands. So you can have a skin gland cyst. Hey, okay, look at this. That's the best picture that I can see. It arises secondary to infection and scarring of the small duct. Okay, so another lesion are epidermal inclusion cysts or sebaceous cysts. It's the most common small vulvar cysts. It's a pure white or yellow with cautious contents on cut section. This is very common with uh, a sebaceous cyst. <coughs> And um, the inclusion cyst is arises when bits of um, epithelium are implanted in the skin surface, so vulva. But sometimes they are seen at the site of episiotomy. So it becomes vaginal cyst already, most likely due to a previous trauma when found in the vagina. So this is your episiotomy okay, site. And you can see an inclusion cyst there, or what's the epidermal inclusion cyst or a sebaceous cyst. So this is how sometimes it looks like also. Next is the nevus. Aside from the cyst, you can have a nevus. The nevus is the usual mole. So sometimes they, it also occurs in the vulva. And when it occurs there, you see that uh, it, it recognizes the person. No? It's a localized nest and cluster of melanocytes. That's why it's black or brownish and arises from the embryonic neural crest and are present from birth. So it's one of the most common benign neoplasms in females, generally asymptomatic because it's benign. Sometimes when the baby, uh, you're going to catch the newborn after the baby, so you sometimes recognize, you know, check for nevi or moles uh, during this time, okay? Next, we have, uh, yeah, this is still the nevus. Look at that. It's 3 to 10 millimeters. It's usually flat, sometimes a little elevated or pedunculated. Look at the borders, they're very sharp. And the color is even 
the shape is symmetrical. So if it is otherwise, no, it's the opposite. Then that's usually a malignant uh, the, uh, thing, no. This one is usually asymptomatic. Okay. As compared to a hemangioma, look at this. This is malformation of the blood vessels. That's why it looks reddish or brown to red or purple because it's uh, blood vessels, no? It's usually single. This is the um, labia majora. So that's part of the vulva. So that's uh, that's why it's a vulva mass. You look at this, it look like this. It's usually one to two centimeter in diameter. It's flat and soft. And the color, as yes, I've said, is brown to red or purple. So sometimes you can uh, see um, him, hemangiomas like this. Okay, this one, sometimes you have thin walled capillaries arranged randomly and separated by thin connective tissue septa. It's usually asymptomatic when the baby becomes older. Sometimes it gets louder or smaller, uh, larger. It may become ulcerated and it bleeds. No? Sometimes there are other types of hemangiomas, like you have a strawberry hemangioma, a cavernous hemangioma, you can have a senile hemangioma, an angiokeratoma, or a pyogenic granuloma. Uh, pyogenic hemangioma. No? Strawberry hemangioma, the one I discussed a while ago, it, it may regress inside. It's just a congenital defect like this. But sometimes it regresses slower. No? Okay. And then a cavernous. It's usually purple. It's very inside. It's a larger lesion. Extend deeply into the subcutaneous tissue. If you look at that. It appear in the first two, few months. There could be spontaneous resolution with a cavernous hematoma. A senile hematoma, the word senile or cherry, they're usually in postmenopausal women. And there's a lot of hemangiomas that occurs on the skin of a postmenopausal woman. But when it becomes, it, it, it arises at the vulva or the labia majori, Majora, then it could be senile or cherry angiomas. Look at that, it's less than 3 millimeter in diameter. It's multiple and red, red brown to dark blue. An antiochiratoma also can arise in the vulva. It's approximately two times the size of a cherry, or it's a lot of cherries, which is purple to dark red. Occurs in women when 30 to 50 years old, there's rapid growth. The whole vulva can be occupied by the angiokeratoma. Okay? And it has a tendency to bleed during strenuous exercise. So, this is how some of the angiokeratomas will look like. It's just, it looks like a white lesion, no? but there's a lot. So pyogenic granuloma is common. You have heard it this before during the pregnancy. Where's the common location of a pyogenic granuloma in pregnant women? Anybody? Hello, are you still awake? From 240 participants? Yes, doc. Uh uh is is this familiar to you? This name, pyogenic granuloma. It's an overgrowth of inflamed granulation tissue. It grows under hormonal influence of pregnancy. Where's the common location when it's during pregnancy? Uh, colon cavity. Yeah, the gingiva. No? So when it's in the vulva. You have to remove that wide and deep excision 
to prevent recurrence. During the pregnancy, you just don't have to remove that. It will just regress in size after the delivery of the baby. So diagnosis is just gross inspection of the vascular lesion. It's usually asymptomatic. Look at that. It also looks like a hemangioma. And uh, when there is bleeding, no, you just do a subtotal or a total reception of that lesion. So fibroma, next. Okay. It's a most common benign solid tumor of the vulva. This one. It's solid. This one is solid. Commonly found in the labia. It occurs in all age groups and with a small, smooth surface and distinct contour. Look at that. It arises from the majora. So it has a low-grade malignant potential, poten potential ma to become malignant. Uh, usually when they're small, they are asymptomatic. But when they become huge like this, this is the one that's found in the literature from an African woman, the biggest uh, vulvar fibroma that is uh, seen in the literature. Okay, look at that. It, it is heavy because it's solid. And the larger tumors, they produce chronic pressure symptoms or they may produce pain. So what's the treatment when you have that type of mass? You have to remove that you know, operative procedure so that uh, the woman can have a good quality of life. As opposed to lipoma, this one, it's like spongy. No? Uh, it's a rare mesenchymal tumor. It's a benign mesenchymal tumor, but it's not that common. You have mature fat cells often interspaced with strands of fibrous connective tissue. That's a lipoma. That's why it's soft. Arises from the vulvar fatty pads. Okay, look at that. It's softer than a fibroma. And majority are smaller than the 3 centimeter in diameter. I was able to remove a lipoma from a 30-year-old woman. Just almost like this. Also. And most lipomas, look at that. That lipoma I removed was like this. So. so you can just press on it. It's like sponge, no? And it's very superficial in location. It's low-growing and very low malignant potential. Okay, this is how we excise it. We just remove the fat pads. No, that's the fat that was found in the lipoma after surgery. Endometriosis. Have you heard of endometriosis? What's the yes. most common location of an endometriosis? What's the common location? It's the ovary. No, but the vulva can also have endometriosis. It's uncommon though, one in 500 women. Usually there's a small firm nodule which may be cystic or solid. Few millimeters, sometimes you cannot even notice it. And uh, the patient will come in because of introital pain and dyspareunia. Okay, so what are the locations? Site of old healed of septic laceration. That's why when you ask the history of the patient, okay, she has an obstetric laceration and episiotomy site. There's um, sometimes you can notice it after removal of a Bartonin cyst or along the canal of knock. And the pathophysiology, it's secondary to a metaplasia, retrograde lymphatic spread, or potential implantation of the endometrial tissue during operation. So you see sometimes uh, through the blood, no, there can be, since it comes from the endometrium, no, there is endometrial tissue that will come out in the vagina during delivery. 
and might in, be implanted in the episiotomy site. That's why it's common. Patients come here, come in because of cyclic discomfort. When we say cyclic discomfort, it occurs during menses, no? and it's cyclical. And you see, there's enlargement of the mass during menses. And look at that. It's just a flat mass. No, but it's so painful. That's the character of endometriosis. So when the patient will have that and you're able to establish that it's an um, endometriosis of the vulva, we have to do wide excision and laser vaporization depending on the mass. Recur because it's an endometriosis, uh, recurrence after treatment is common because of inadequate removal so that's why you have recurrences that's why not all endometriosis will be treated surgically there's already a medical management for endometriosis hematoma also a common occurrence in young women okay usually secondary to a blunt trauma or could be there could be a straddle injury because of a fall or because of recreational activities, or there could be a spontaneous hematoma, a rupture of a varicose vein. That could be maybe in pregnant women with varicosities of the vulva. Okay, that might happen. No? That's why you're, these pregnant women, if they have these varicosities on the vulva, they're very afraid. They really come to the obstetrician. And we obstetricians do not recommend them to deliver at the clinic or they have to go to the hospital because we're afraid there might be a rupture of a varicose vein that will cause hemorrhage or torrential bleeding. The management is usually conservative, except if it's more than 10 centimeters and it's expanding, it does not respond to direct pressure then we have to uh, do operative therapy on these patients and remove the blood clots and identify where the bleeding is coming from. Look for the key responsible vein and you may apply wet wax. Dermatologic lesions, you know that already because it's common in babies, secondary to a contact dermatitis from because babies nowadays or small kids nowadays they usually on disposable diapers for 24 hours no so for our patients we have to tell the mothers that they have to remove change the diaper every 4 hours at least no uh, so that the patient will not develop this type of contact dermatitis these lesions, there are also lesions on the vulva which can be caused by neurodermatitis, psoriasis, seborrheic dermatitis, cutaneous candidiasis, and lichen planus. Okay, that's like scale-like rashes could be secondary to psoriasis. Look at this. This is... Um, uh, what's this contact dermatitis usually in infants no? there is moisture and heat in the intertrigenous areas which can cause the irritation usually wet and whipping lesions of the vulva in the babies no? so please uh, do not tell your patients that putting ointments and lotions may produce secondary in irritation so unless that that lotion or that ointment that will be applied has um, therapeutic effect then you can give that okay so that's all for the vulva what did we have we had a lot so you can just read your books go through it so you will really uh, be able to familiarize yourself with that let's go now to the vagina let's go inner uh, the number one is the urethral diverticulum, which is a sac-like projection arising from the posterior vulva. Okay. 
it usually presents as a mask in the anterior vaginal wall. So if this is the vagina, look at that. So the mass will be usually in the anterior vaginal wall so that when you do an internal examination of the uterus, okay, you'll be able to feel the mass on there. So if you push, push your fingers here, the mass will be located in the anterior portion, okay? So it is usually congenital or acquired and it results from repetitive or chronic infections of the peri-retral nerves. So for patients like this, we usually refer our patients to the uh, urogynecologist, okay? So that's here, urethra, and you have the bladder. You have the uterus there on the upper portion of the bladder. So you'll be able, when you do an internal examination, you'll be able to see Feel the mass on the anterior portion of the uh, vagina. So some patients will come in with dyspareunia, this this year, dribbling of urine, in spite of treating them with antimicrobials. No, every now and then you give antimicrobials. There's still this urea, dyspareunia, and dribbling. Think of urethral diverticulum. Okay, so how do you diagnose that by avoiding cystourethrography? And cystourethroscopy. It's only the urogynecologist who performs this for obstetricians or gynecologists. For the main no? gynecologist. So what's the treatment? Excisional surgery will do. You can do it transurethral or transvaginal approach depending on where that mass is leaning. Is it anterior, more anterior, or more posterior near the vaginal canal? Then you can approach it through the vagina. Tampon. Have you heard of tampon? Girls and boys, have you heard of tampons? Okay, that's for menses, cyclic menses, no? And the problem with tampons is that it's made... It's being used by teenagers in the past. We haven't heard of tampons until we had cases of complications from the tampons. You know, these young girls, they have ballet, you know, they have extracurricular activities. So they're asked to wear tampons and then they can still wear their white, white, white pants, you know, things like that. But sometimes these young girls, they forget that they still have the tampon inside because the blood will not come out. No, that's why these tampons it's it will be associated with the microscopic epithelial changes, no, causing infection. And there will be epithelial dehydration and epithelial layering, causing the vaginal ulcers, no. And sometimes if this is not treated, it can cause toxic shock syndrome. So that's when we came to realize what tampons are and what it's, it's for. No? And it's usually produced by staph aureus. Uh, the microscopic ulcers found with the uh, overuse no, or tampons which were not removed is brought about by the drying and the pressure necrosis induced by the tampon. So that's what we call the classic tamp uh, forgotten tampon. No? Treatment, if it is uh, early stage, you can give oral uh, cream, cream initially. But if it's already a severe infection, then you can give IV antibiotics. So trauma also can cause uh, problems in the vagina. Coitus is the most frequent etiology. You know, women are exposed to persons out the, outside their country. So that intermarriage is very common. Uh, this is global already. But since uh, Filipino women, they are small women, no? So 
most probably they have small vaginas. So that's why they they marry whites, no white people. So and big uh, organs, no. That's why um, there might be a coital injury that happens after the first intercourse, no. So this results to vaginal lacerations, secondary to sexual intercourse. But there are other causes here. And these spreading poses, uh, you might be able to as be assigned in the op uh, emergency room. And in the middle of the night, a woman comes in, brought about with a partner, um, bleeding. So think of a coital injury. Okay. So intercourse after a prolonged period of abstinence is directly innovation. These are the factors. So what will you see there? Transverse tear of the posterior fornix. It's like a lacer linear laceration that can occur in the other parts. But the most common is the uh, posterior fornix. Okay. Uh, the location of the coital injury is believed to be related to the poor support of the upper vagina, which is supported by a thin layer of connective tissue. Okay, the most prominent symptom is vaginal bleeding, and management is prompt suturing under adequate anesthesia. So, naka, um, patient can be on um, spinal anesthesia. So let's go to the cervix. What are what are the um, benign lesions of the cervix? Number one is an endometrial, uh, no, endocervical or cervical polyp, which is the most common benign neoplastic growth of the cervix. It's usually in post uh, multi uh, multiparous women, forties and fifties, and it's usually secondary to inflammation and abnormal focal responsiveness to hormonal stimulation. So there are a lot of women in their 40s or 50s. They come in for pap smear, and that's the only time that we notice that there is a small, um, what's this, a polyp there, no? and the cervical polyp, so, but it does not cause any bleeding. There are some women who come in again without intervention, and the polyp will be gone. No? It's just inflammation, uh, in responsiveness to hormonal stimulation. That's why you see that uh, it can be uh, managed uh, just by observation. Okay, so look at that. There's small polyp. It can be narrow. There can be a long pedicle. No? With these polyps and those from the ectocervix, they can have short, broad base, and these are very common in postmenopause. And what is the management? That's what we call polypectomy, wherein you just grab the base of the uh, polyp with a speculum, no, or a polyp forceps, okay. And then submit the specimen to the lab. So if you do this, if the patient usually complains of bleeding, if you remove, if the polyp is the one that's causing the bleeding and remove the polyp second by, by this one, um, polypectomy, then the patient will be, you know, because there will be no bleeding after right away. So Nabothian cyst is another type of cyst in the, uh, where's this, cervix. Okay, these are the tension cysts of endocervical columnar cells. They occur where a tunnel of cleft has been covered by squamous metaplasia. It's usually considered the normal feature of the adult. So when you do pap smear on these patients, you'll be able to, do, to see Nabothian cysts. They're usually located the area where the squamous metaplasia will go, near the squamocolumnar junction. 
Okay, grossly, look at that, translucent, opaque, whitish, or yellow in color. They can undergo spontaneous healing, uh, produced by the spontaneous healing process of the cervix, but we can have spontaneous healing of the nabothian. What about laceration? So the cervix can be lacerated anytime during the vaginal delivery or during forceful intercourse, sometimes because of sexual abuse. So it can result to bleeding also. When the cervix will have a laceration, then there is profuse bleeding that will follow. No? So the management, when it's acute, it should be sutured so that the cervical tear that happens after a vaginal delivery, delivery that is considered acute bleeding. So we suture that in the operating room while the patient still uh, asleep, no? Because of the, um, what's this? Sometimes it'll be now between, it causes sedation. So sometimes the complication for this repair of uh, this type of lesions is incompetence of the cervix. Myomas, what's the most common location of a myoma? Where is the myoma most likely seen? In the uterine cavity, but not in the cervix. So if it is the cervix, then it's not common and it's usually rare. So the symptoms is just like that of a myoma. And what do we do when we see that? We can do myomectomy or hysterectomy for this kind of patient. Now, let's move on to benign lesions of the uterus. Can I have a break first? Wait, huh? Are you still in class? Are you yes, still sir. with me? Okay, very good. Hope, uh, wait for a while, huh? Okay, let's move on. Benign lesions of the uterus. We're almost done. Don't worry. So the first is endometrial polyp. Remember, you have polyp of the cervix. You also have polyp of the endometrium. When it's the endometrial polyp, it's a localized overgrowth of endometrial glands and stroma that project beyond the surface of the endometrium. So remember that glands and stroma are only found histologically and they're only located in the endometrium. That's why the endometriosis is a growth of glands and stroma outside the endometrium. Okay, it's, it might be located in the vulva, located in the ovary. So this one, the polyp, also an overgrowth of glands and stroma, and they just project outside the endo endometrium. That's why they have ped pedicle that's uh, attached to the fundus, and it's only very, very small. It just enlarges when you see it on hysteroscopy. So the peak incidence is about 40 and 49, between 40 and 49. It's associated with endometrial hyperplasia, like you have an opposed estrogen or chronic administration of tamoxifen. And majority are usually asymptomatic, but when they are symptomatic, they are usually associated with abnormal bleeding patterns like menorrhagia, Premenstrual and postmenstrual staining, scanty postmenstrual spotting. No, so the polyp has a malignant transformation, and it's estimated to be as high as three to four percent. Anyways, the polyp, when 
uh, when you see them, these patients will complain of vaginal bleeding. No? So how do you diagnose a polyp? By transvaginal sonogram, hydroson hydrosonography, or hysteroscopy. Okay, look at that. So what's the management? We can do curatage. You dilate the cervix and you do some curatage to remove, no? But what happens when you do a curatage and not a hysteroscopy? Sometimes when you put the curat here, the polyp will be there. And then when you scrape again on the other side, the polyp will just go to the other side. So you will not, this happened to me in my practice already. I already did a curatage because that was the procedure of choice of the patient. And what happens? The bleeding did not stop. No? So I asked somebody to do the hysteroscopy and we noted the polyp is still intact. So sometimes it's better when it's done hysteroscopically. Leiomyomas, it's a common, the most common tumor of the uterus. You know this already. I will not uh, deal on this too much. Everything will be in your book. It's usually called fibroids or fibromyomas. It's a common indication for hysterectomy. And they arise in the reproductive age group. And when it becomes symptomatic, there is usually abnormal bleeding or pelvic pain or pressure. And if, if it occurs in some patients, no, it causes reproductive problems like infertility and adverse pregnancy outcomes. So... When you say intramural myoma, mural, let's say in the myometrium, no? it's located within the uterine wall. It may enlarge sufficiently to distort the uterine cavity or the serosal surface. And it may extend to the serosa outside or the inside to the mucosal surface. That's why you call it intramural could be with sub serous component like this one and a sub serosal component. Maybe we have other pictures. Uh, this is what I was saying. Huh? So just like a, you have an intramural myoma 50% of the time, it invades now the mucosa. mucosa. So it's, caused, it's called a submucous myoma. This one you have also 50% uh, invasion, but sometimes there's full submucous myoma, like the one at the pointer, laser pointer. So this submucous myoma, they are derived from myometrial cells just below the endometrium. It protrudes into the uterine cavity and it extends, of, the extent of this protrusion is the uh, described by the FIGO, no? and classification is based also on my uh, specimens on my So when you say T1, it extends in less than 50% of the myometrium. T2 extends more than 50% of the myometrium. Okay, so... Also with myoma, there's what you call a prolapse submucus. So submucus, it's inside the uterus, okay? And what happens? It prolapses. So like for this one, can you see this intracavitary myoma? No. Sometimes when that uterus, when that myoma becomes heavier, it's so difficult for that uterus to hold on to the myoma. So what happens because it is a pedicle, the myoma will go down into the vagina like this one. And this, um, what's this? This one, the pedicle, okay? That's what holds there in the myometrium. And then you have a prolapsing myoma. Okay, sub -serous. So this one, the one in the circle blue, that's a sub -serous, So sub serosa originates from the endometrium at the serosal surface of the uterus. 
It may have a broad or pedunculated base. It may be intraligamentary, which means it the ligament, broad ligament, no, just like this. Or it can be a parasitic myoma, wherein uh, there was a myoma maybe in the serosal myoma. It could be a serosal myoma. And then because it's already heavy, it will lie on top of the intestines, no? And then it will it will now get its blood supply from the peritoneal cavity or any organ, usually the omentum, usually the intestine. It attaches itself there. So this is what happens. So when it attaches uh, itself, it is it gets its blood supply from that uh, uterus. That's why it becomes a parasitic myoma. Cervical myoma, we've discussed that already. So what are the risk factors for myomas? You can have reproductive and endocrine factors. The parity, there's a decreased chance of fibroid myoma if you have more children. Early menarche, less than 10, is associated with increased risk of uh, myoma. Hormonal contraception can also cause uh, myoma, no? it, but it does not cause fibroids to grow. Therefore, the administration of these drugs is not contraindicated in patients with fibroids. Obesity has also increased chance of having a myoma. The diet significant in beef and other red meats, fruit with decreased risk, can decrease the risk, especially for if it is a citrus fruit. No, dairy products can have uh, inversely related to the fibroid risk. Dietary glycemic index associated with small uh, increase in the fibroid. Alcohol uh, can also have increased risk. No, Smoking, however, does not increase the risk. It actually decreases the risk. I don't know why. Genetics also has an effect on the occurrence of a myoma, the race and ethnicity, and the major life events, stress. Features, you know, already it could be, if it is an intramural myoma, then it could cause hypogastric pain. When it is um, submucous myoma, then it can cause an, what's this um, vaginal bleeding. No? Also, when it is a submucous myoma, it can cause infertility or increased um, abnormalities of the pregnancy. Okay, this one are the common heavy and prolonged menstrual bleeding, bulk related symptoms, and retroductive dysfunction. Okay, let's not go into that. So the myoma, if it is big already, it was not removed. It will undergo several degenerative changes of the myoma. And these are the most common ones that are described in the literature. So you may get hold. Remember only these ones. The one, the carnius myoma, however or the, the red is the most acute form and it's usually present in pregnancy. But the highly degeneration, it's the mildest form. That's what we usually see in the operating room. So this type of myomas, we can uh, not go deeper into that. Uh, so the etiology of a myoma, each two more cell results from a single muscle cell, multiple chromosomal abnormalities, and abnormal karyotype may be detected. The neoplastic transformation is a result of a somatic mutation. No? But uh, generally, myoma is a benign lesion. The growth is influenced by estrogen and progesterone and local growth factors. 
And so look at this. If you compare, this is the benignly shot. And this is the malignant leiomyosarcoma. So different borders, no? It's irregular border. So when you cut a myoma, the gross specimen of a myoma, you'll have a lighter color with the normal endometrium. So that's what we call the glistening pearl white appearance. We don't really forget that. Even me, I was I don't forget that it, there will be a world appearance when you cut off the smooth muscle. So diagnosis, the best way is to do pelvic to be followed by a transvaginal sonogram. So myoma depends on the patient's acceptance of the procedure or the doctor's acceptance and of the procedure depending on growth. But if it if with abnormal bleeding, then we do endometrial sampling and check what is the size of the myoma under anesthesia if it warrants a myomectomy or hysterectomy. Okay, so treatment, there's manage um there's the myomas can be managed medically, depending on the case, through the use of GnRH agonies, medroxyprogesterone acetate, danazole, and aromatase inhibitors. So the disadvantage of a medical treatment, sometimes you'll be able to have a secondary change of the myoma already because of the length of time that you did not consent for a surgery. And if you have um, a length of time that surgery was not done, no? sometimes the patient, if you give medical management, will undergo hyperestrogenic side effects. So there will be increased incidence of vasomotor flashes and trabecular bone loss. The cost also is the one that, the, because one injection will cost around 10000 and the patient needs three injections in 24 hours sometimes. So sometimes it's not so easy to have the medical management for the myoma. And after all, that myoma really needs to be removed. Okay. So for surgical management, these are the indications for surgery, rapidly expanding pelvic mass, persistent abdominal bleeding, pain or pressure enlargement of the brain. Uh, this is what you call the transurethral uterine artery embolization. It's quite new, but it's not already because this is already mentioned in our book. So the newest modality in managing uterine myomas. It's not actually uh, newest no, because there's a newer one, which is the high-intensity focused ultrasound where you don't need to undergo surgery. Adenomyosis, remember the glands and stroma that I told you? It's the growth of glands and stroma outside the endometrium. So for adenomyosis, the glands and stroma will go to the myometrium. Okay, that's what we call adenomyosis, adenomyoma, or aden endometriosis interna. That's an old term. So it can be diffuse or there could be a focal lesion if it's a adenomyosis. Okay, and the cut surface will reveal darker than the white surface of the myoma. And histologic exam will reveal benign endometrial glands and stroma. Okay, for clinical diagnosis, sometimes we can diagnose if the patient will every now and then complain of secondary hist uh, dysmenorrhea. Okay. Okay, you can read on that, no? So hysterectomy is the definitive treatment for a myoma. Let's go to the fallopian tubes. This is the more important adenomatoid tumors, which is the most prevalent benign tumor of the uvida. It's also named as angiomyoma. They're very small. Look at that because the fallopian tube is a very small organ as compared to the uterus. 
And you can have paratubalcies. That's the most common report that we see nowadays because of minimally invasive surgery. So when you see that, you have to remove that. Okay. So torsion of the fallopian tube is very rare. It usually comes with an ovarian cyst. So together, they twist around itself. So uh, that's what happens to uh, this type of uh, uh, abnormalities of the fallopian tube. So the last is the benign lesions of the ovaries. The number one is the follicular cysts. They are the most frequent cystic structures in normal ovaries. They arise from temporary variation of a normal physiologic process. Okay. And sometimes they lead from a dominant mature follicle failing to rupture. So sometimes when you have patients who come in with a result of follicular cyst, please, please, please do not remove that will just uh, lessen in size after, uh, you know, um, it will lessen in the size of five days after the onset of menses. So management is conservative observation if it decreases in size. Corpus luteum cyst is another benign cyst of the ovary. It's less common with the usual more of the patient, but it's common if um, associated with normal endocrine function or prolonged secretion of progesterone. It's usually small, 4 cm in diameter. It has a smooth surface and purplish to brown color. Okay, that's what an endometrioma will look like. Endomyometrum. And next, thicalutein cysts. These are common with H mole. Exogenous gonadotrophins are very excessive. There's excessive stimulation. That's why the ovaries will enlarge. Okay. Benign cystic teratoma is a common ovarian neoplasm, accounts for 90% of germ cell tumors, very slowly growing up to 20 years. It's a common uh, benign tumor, most common ovarian tumor in prepubertal women, and it has the tendency to become bilateral no? sometimes. So unilateral usually, but can go bilateral. Okay. And uh, when you talk of ovarian cyst also, uh, especially serous myoma, I, uh, serous uh, cyst adenoma, sometimes it's associated with this thyrotoxicosis, carcinoid syndrome, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, Okay, this can uh, be associated with the dermoid cyst when it is a struma ovary, when the teratoma in which the thyroid tissue has overgrown the other elements in the and is the predominant tissue. Okay. Endometriomas, we've discussed that. The most common uh, location is the ovary also. So the same as in the endometriosis. Okay, the patient will usually complain of pelvic pain. This one is this pain, yeah. And infertility. Okay. Fibroma, we've I've said that already in the vulvar fibroma, the same etiology, okay, and the same procedure that can be done. This one, you can have a lapro laparoscopic removal of the ovary or exploratory operation. Okay, torsion, as I've said, you have an ovarian cyst. It will twist with the fallopian tube to cause a uh, 
proportion of both fallopian and ovary. Okay, I think this is the last. Any questions? 